Well, I'm going to uh, I'm going to talk today about substance abuse because it's one of the things that's probably the fastest growing industry in, in West Virginia, and I know Nate's in Tennessee, and we both see a large number of patients that are, are substance abuse affected. What I'm going to do is link this a little bit to uh, some of the topics in uh, women's reproductive health because I think there's some very interesting uh, uh, relationships and sequelae to this. Uh, what I'll do is talk about, I like to talk about it as the elephant in the room, and a lot of my research now is focused on substance abuse. I'm going to talk a lot about it from a West Virginia standpoint and just also uh, from a national standpoint a little bit as well. Uh, this is where I work out of Women's and Children's Hospital, one of the uh, freestanding hospitals, about seven or eight in the country, about uh, 250, 300 beds. Um, I like Edmund Burke, not only because he's Irish, but because he also has some very interesting things to say. And he was actually not just a, he was also, a, he was a statesman, not a politician. You notice I put statesman. And that's because he actually got it. He said, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men and women to do nothing. So if you think that you're going to escape this, this problem of substance abuse, if you don't do obstetrics and gynecology, uh, guess again. I think if you would uh, talk to people over the next few years, you're going to see more and more of this as a, as a really big issue in, uh, in OBGYN and also in medicine in general, along with the obesity problem that we have in West Virginia. I like to show pictures of my children because I don't think any of us are, uh, not, are operate out of a void. My son is the big boy over here, that's Paul, and he's uh, winning the hearts and minds of people in Afghanistan with a 155 millimeter gun. That's the projectile, it weighs over 100 pounds and goes 30 clicks down range. And uh, as he says, that uh, it gets people's attention when he does that, so. I always tell everybody, this is my part where I always wave a you know, nod to people like Nate, who's German, and my wife, who are German, and everybody else who likes Ordnung, Ordnung, Ordnung. And so they like to know all what we're going to do and what we're going to talk about. So this is it. We're going to talk about uh, introduction a little bit, which we're doing, the scope of this problem, why you care. I'm going to talk about abortion and related psychological effects because there is a relationship almost one-to-one -one with that and with uh, substance use. I'm going to talk about West Virginia a little bit and my, um, also my hospital. I'm going to talk about how we're dealing with this and some of the challenges that remain uh, in the future for us as we continue to, to deal with this big problem. I'd also like to show pictures of my grandchildren. This is Katie. She's the, one of the most beautiful grandchildren in the world, right? And we're, we're at Disney World. And I see my cute little shirt on that. Nice. That's very nice. Yeah. That's, my other, that's my daughter who dresses me in that stuff. And we're watching Beauty and the Beast. There we go. So basically what I really want to talk about is how to identify and intervene in uh, patients who are using drug and alcohol. And I want to talk about a little bit how we, how we do this and sort of our, our approach with this in West Virginia. Objectives again, because we have to do CME, I have to do objectives as always. We're going to talk about identifying, and we're going to talk about how we're going to intervene, and then we're going to talk about what you might want to think about if you're going to put together a team for this. Well, if you look at this uh, nationally, the latest uh, data that I was able to find nationally is about 10 to 14 percent of women uh, admit to using illicit drugs. Uh, how many do you think admitted to it in my practice? We do it, everybody gets asked that, every practice, right? You know how many, how many admitted to? Zero. 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 So the state said, well, we really don't have a problem, do we? Ah, uh, well, we'll talk about that. Nene Lafson syndrome increases the average cost of delivery in my world from about two grand to over $36,000. Uh, these patients spend days to weeks to months in the hospital going through withdrawal. Uh, the number of patients at Marshall that, that when they looked at went from 25 to 70 in about four years back in the early uh, 2000s. Our CORD study that we did, I'm going to show you that data because what we said is, well, let's, let's look and see what really is happening. Oh, this is my daughter Mercy at 18 weeks. Isn't she cute? Look at that. She's already sucking her little thumb on it. Yeah. Um, what I want to talk about before I get to my data, though, is I want to talk about psychological effects. And the reason I want to talk about that with abortion is that there's such a huge relationship between abortion and substance abuse. And if you look at the papers that have been put out, there's a huge increase in illicit drug use, alcohol use, and also very, very high risk for the psychological effects and comorbidities. If you look in my clinic, 50% of my patients admit to or have had some sort of psychiatric intervention or mental health, uh, uh, um, use of mental health services that are in my clinic. So it's not just about substances, it's actually also about mental health issues that we have to deal with that are the comorbidities. If you look at anxiety with the first pregnancy ending in a termination or pregnancy that were unintended, okay, there's a huge increase in general anxiety, 86% higher in Hispanics, 42% higher risk in American women, and a 46% higher risk for anxiety during 20 years of age if you have an abortion. And 
course, part of this idea is how do you treat your anxiety? How do you deal with that? Well, anxiety, part of that whole deal is the axis of dopamine, right? And you need your limbic system and the reticular activating system, all the areas that are in the midbrain. So they would like to treat that and increase their dopamine. And the way they do a lot of that is with their substances. They damp down the anxiety with substances. You look at sleep disorders, it's also much higher in people who have had previous termination of pregnancy. 85% higher risk of sleep disorders in six months. 68% higher a year. Very, very large numbers of patients, even up to three, two, three, and four years across the time frame after abortion. So what we're setting up is a very interesting group of individuals who are all very high risk for mental health issues and also very high risk for substances. You look at adolescents that have used marijuana, and for those of you who don't, who didn't inhale, right, back in Clinton here, who didn't inhale. This is the comparison. If you use, if you had an abortion at a very early age in life, you have very, very high use of THC, you have very high use of counseling, and a very high use of sleep disorder. No surprise to any of us, right? And we don't sleep, what do you do? You medicate. Right? You medicate. My favorite story is always, and I don't be able to probably say the same thing, or maybe Dr. Callum. Well, I just, one of my friends gave me something, or my mom gave me something else. And I always ask, well, what was that? Oh, I don't know what that was. I said, really? You don't know what that was? So if I gave you this cyanide capsule, you take that too. I, I just have to laugh. It cracks me up. It's not a lie. Or some dudes, it's always like some dude gave it to me. Yeah. So subsequent pregnancy and abortion compared to previous life are 900% more likely to use marijuana, almost 500% likely to use illicit drugs, including heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine, and the list goes on, and 122% more likely to use alcohol in the time frame after the abortion. So again, all of this related to previous lifestyle choices and all those things that have done to look at the substances increased use. If you look at substance abuse, it's 200% higher for marijuana, 200% uh, higher for cocaine, 400% higher for other drugs like the, the benzodiazepines and the, uh, the opiates, 200% uh, illicit drugs, 100% higher for tobacco use, and these are not seen with previous miscarriages or stillbirth. In other words, the increases are not seen with losses that are not related to abortions. So, I'm laying the groundwork to help you understand is part of this question, the reason I asked about previous abortions is about mental health issues and about substances. You can almost make a one-to-one -one correlation almost every time. Well, this is Faith getting ready for therapy. It's kind of a squishy picture. That's floppy Faith. And uh, <laughs> this was Thursday, and she's getting ready to go to therapy, and she's uh, giving her mother a hard time. She cracks me up. The only handicap is in your mind, not hers. She'll run you over in a wheelchair, frankly. Right? That's why she doesn't have a mechanized one. Seriously, she would, she'd ran me. Um, just because she could, and she would annoy you. Just because you, especially if you thought she could really get to you, she'd do that. So this is what we did in West Virginia. We said, let's take a look in August of 2009, because nobody uses drugs in West Virginia, right? Nobody's used it. And we said, let's look at the nine major, uh, major medical centers. We're going to take a month, and we're just going to take all the deliveries, and we're going to look at all the cord plots. We're not going to identify. We're not going to identify socioeconomic status. We're not going to identify by insurance status. We're not going to do comorbidities. We're not going to ask. We're just going to, everybody's going to get a core blood at every one of these participating institutions. And since it was a state study and it was anonymized and there was no identifiers, we could just do this, right? So this is what we looked at. We had about 800, uh, in that month, about 800, 750, 760 deliveries that we got core bloods from. There were more, more deliveries than that, but that's about the number of deliveries that we got. Out of that total, we had 15% positive at delivery for substances. Okay? And nobody uses drugs. And nobody uses alcohol. Well, let's look and see our drugs of choice, at least in West Virginia. Oh, cannabinoids. That's not a problem, is it? It's, it's, it's natural. <laughs> it's organic. It's for my nausea. <laughs> That's why it's for my nausea. Right. And it's natural. It's, natural. it's organic. Well, I, I'm not sure the rat poison they put in there and the other junk, the PCP and all that's probably organic. Whatever. Uh, and we have actually in our population we have very little use of amphetamines. That does not appear to be a drug of choice in West Virginia particularly. We didn't have really much cocaine. We still have a little bit in my clinic and I'll talk a little bit about that. But our biggest problem are our opiates, our cannabinoids, and the methadone is supposedly being given by people from clinics. But that ain't so. Nobody drinks, but look at how much alcohol it is. Nobody drinks. Nobody uses alcohol. And 
benzos are the other drug of choice in West Virginia. This is the cutest grandbaby. This is a little ginger. This is Penelope. This is, Penelope. And this is on her first birthday. And she, like, this is Pippi Longstock. This is who this is of a child. Right? It's like Pippi. Nobody knows who Pippi Longstock is. Isn't one of them. <laughs> You're just ashamed to admit it because that would be how old you are. Is that what you're trying to yeah. Not only do we have specific substances, the polypharmacy is very, very common, right? If you look at those of the people who use the substances, it's usually a variable, you know, cornucopia, pharmacopia of substances for abuse. It's not just one. We need something to get up, something to get down, something to sleep, something to make you feel better. It's all this uh, better living through chemistry. And if you look at the, 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 typical, uh, the typical combinations, you get opiates and cannabinoids very much, opiates and benzos quite a bit. Oh, they're supposed to be on methadone only, but they're not. They're taking other opiates as well. And oh, by the way, they're also doing alcohol. And so as you see, people on methadone are also smoking weed, they're also doing benzos, they're also doing alcohol. Right? None of which you're supposed to do on, on methadone, right? You're not supposed to be doing that. And they're supposed to screen you and counsel you when you're on methadone. Anybody here ever talked to anybody from methadone clinics? I hope nobody's here that would offend. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> that a methadone clinic? They don't get counsel. Okay, they don't. And they don't get counseling the subutex clinics either, or suboxone clinics. At least in my area, they don't. Mostly. We'll talk about that. <laughs> if you look at alcohol use and you look at the hospitals, I don't know. They must just have better whiskey in Wheeling because Wheeling was the one that had the highest level of, of alcohol use. My hospital is in the middle here about 8%. They're just not doing a whole lot in Huntington. And, uh, it's just uh, up farther north they're doing different things, right? Well, this is my lovely first wife, Catherine. I always like to show pictures of her because she's, as you know, they would say my saint and lovely first wife dad. So in West Virginia, we have a real issue. And I dare say you all do too. And it's across all socioeconomic backgrounds. It's across all strata, all insurance statuses, and everywhere that you do this. So we have a very big problem in West Virginia. In fact, right now, I think every one of my doctors now locally, we started doing this about three years ago. Every doctor locally I have now who does pra private practice all does universal drug screening now. That's how, that's how bad it is. So this is like 2011 data. I don't have all the 2012s compiled yet. I'm still trying to put it together. But this is what we looked at. We had a 32% positive drug screening in my clinic. But nobody uses drugs. Nobody drinks. Nobody. Now they'll tell you they smoke cigarettes, right? Because that's a legal drug. And about 35% of my patients are 40% smoke as well. This is what they use. As you see, marijuana is huge because, of course, it's organic. It's, you know, blah, blah, blah. Opiates are the next one. And most of that is prescription opiates, right? And then the benzodiazepines, again, script, that's prescription of benzodiazepines, the methadone, amphetamines a little bit. We don't really see a whole lot of the, of the, other, of the other drugs that we screen for. If you look at by quarter, again, the drug screening is very, very consistently between 25 and 30 percent, and we've seen very little change in that. All of it about the same, 25 or 30 percent of my patients that come through our clinic. If you look at, again, by far away, the biggest drug of abuse is THC. Everybody says, well, THC is not a big issue. Um, but fortunately, that's simply not true. Uh, again, it's an urban legend with the people who like to smoke weed, who use hemp or the hemp heads or whatever you want use hemp or the hemp heads or whatever you want to call it. You know, I was thinking it was a belt, but that's me, I'm old. Uh, it's an entree into all the other drugs. And if you looked at the polysubstance use, you see that THC is very commonly used with other things. It also really does do very bad things to your brain, especially if you're an adolescent. There's been multiple studies now gone, gone out and looking at the way in which uh, uh, tetrahydrocannabinol works for you in heavy marijuana use and later on in life. And it's no surprise to anybody that absolutely it does rewire your brain and makes you basically very unable to problem solve and a total, a total lack of motivation in life because you're busy getting high all the time, right? So it does cook your brain, even though it's organic. Well, all doctors can't be wrong. They smoke camels and any other cigarette, right? Yeah. We, we can't have a problem with drugs, right? It's not a problem. Well, unfortunately, it really is a problem. This is an actual ad from the 1950s, right? Late 40s, early 50s. This is not a. This is a real ad. Well, what about treatment? Um, 
when I first started doing this, believe it or not, many years ago, my actually my paper that I did for my boards was on cocaine. Maternal cocaine, if not my cocaine, maternal cocaine. I want to clarify that. Yeah. Not my use, maternal cocaine use. And I thought everybody was using cocaine when I did this. Well, I was actually partially right. They were using all sorts of drugs, but it just wasn't being seen as such a rampant problem as it is now. When I first started looking at this, even back when I did it many years ago, nobody detoxified anybody. Because, of course, that's a horrible stuff. People go into withdrawal, you know, they'll seize, the babies will die, they'll have three eyes, they'll, you know, whatever. And that's urban legend, too. That's utter nonsense. Okay, that is nonsense. Now, the problem you have is what? As of 2005, it says you can't detoxify somebody unless you have addictions boards. And you can't use anything but what? Methadone and Suboxone or Subutex. So let me share with you what that means. It means that they come into my clinic on Lortabs, Roxy's, whatever you want to call it, MS Cotton that somebody's been giving them or buying, and I can't detoxify them with the very drugs they're using. I have to put them on something else and send them to a clinic who has no intention of doing anything. Now, why is that? This is going to be very politically incorrect, as usual, right, for me. You come to expect it. What do you get paid to do at a methadone clinic or suboxone clinic? You get paid to dispense it, and you get paid. The more you dispense, the more you get paid. In the state of West Virginia, you may do 250 prescriptions a month and not see the patients. It's a pretty good gig, especially when the average milligrams is 30 to 100 to 130 or 40 or 50 by the time they're pregnant, because you know they need more when they're pregnant, right? So, what has happened is no one will do this because it's against the law. The DEA will come after you. They will do blah, 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 blah. I go, oh, no, 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 no. It's not detoxification. It's therapeutic substitution, ladies and gentlemen. Therapeutic substitution requested by my patients. So we're going to talk about therapeutic substitution now requested by my patients. There you go. Now we can do what we need to do. I just want to lay a little groundwork for you all because if you try to do this, they'll come after you. What? The very drug you addicted them on, I can't use that drug to unaddict them in therapeutic, okay, whatever. I think I'm going through the looking glass, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. This is uh, Mercy, the beautiful, my beautiful youngest daughter. This is the one that would have been actually probably a Rhodes Scholar if Dr. Polky hadn't, no, never mind. She's all grown up, isn't she cute? This is in front of the UN last year, right? We did a choir trip, and uh, we had a great time for the anniversary of uh, the signing of the UN Charter. And the choir got to sing. It was a great time. Well, what about treatment and why I do what I do? There's two ways you can deal with this issue in pregnancy. You can therapeutically substitute and use mom as the way in which you slowly detoxify, if you will, or slowly therapeutically substitute and decrease the amount of opioid or medication. Or you can do this. You can do, let them be born with methadone or suboxone or subutex on board. And you can go through neonatal abstinence syndrome, which is fetal death. You can cause um, IUG, the IUGRs or lizole of all this. You can get preterm birth with all the subs and meconium aspiration. But the biggest issue is the, is, the, is the NAS, with suboxone or with methadone. And we're going to talk about that, neonatal abstinence. If you look at it with straightforward opiate use, it's about 60 to 90 percent of, of the babies will go through with some sort of withdrawal. These are the babies, I don't know uh, how many of you do any of this really with delivery, but these are the babies that you deliver that are screaming screaming, screaming, or they're laying there like they're asleep because they've had so much opiate on board, right? Seventy percent of these will have irritability, which may progress to seizures. Fifty percent will experience respiratory problems, feeding issues, and failure to thrive. This is present in methadone infants, as well as the problem with methadone and with suboxone. This is the real issue with these two drugs. And this is what I keep telling people. You've got to stop doing this because it can happen two to three weeks later. That's when the baby goes through neonatal absence withdrawal. That's when they go through withdrawal. Not in the hospital. And they're sending, in, in some states and places I know, they're sending moms home with methadone for their baby. Here's your methadone. Give it to your baby, so many drops a day. Oh, and by the way, don't you take that. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> no, seriously? Really? Seriously? Uh, this is my grandma, this is my mother. She is the uh, stern lady. Uh, she's Margaret Thatcher and also Maxine. All together. <laughs> <laughs> you know my mom, right? Now, 
face and look at me like, ooh, Andrew. Those of you know my mother, she really is a stern lady. Charming, but I would, I see she still scares me, frankly. <laughs> She's going to be 96 this year, and she just cracks me up. What about treatment rates? The, the dismal fact of the matter is, is that this can be very discouraging because the relapse rate of pregnancy is basically the same. 65 to 80% of people relapse after delivery, after, after being, uh, having some sort of a, a therapeutic uh, substitution. Over 90% relapse in six months, and basically if you look at Subutex, there is no difference in outcomes, and NAS effects are very similar to methadone and opiates. Um, for those of you who have patients who are on Subutex, who are using this, we've had some very, very, very bad things happen. And part of this is, is a lot of these patients are getting this stuff and not telling us, right? They're getting it off the street, they're taking it. The problem we've had is, if you do intrathecal narcotics and you have Subutex on board, that is a very bad thing. Right? And the other thing you have to be very careful of with Subutex and doing these Suboxone is what? Benzodiazepines and other, other sedatives and hypnotics. It gives extremely high incidence of, of death by overdose and interaction with those drugs because they really don't process their benzos and other things very well when they're doing the Suboxone. And there are some synergistic effects that you get. You also cannot give people who are on Subutex narcotics because they don't do well with that, <coughs> with that particular medication. So Subutex and Suboxone really do limit what we're trying to do in terms of pain relief, in terms of dealing with some of the issues we have in labor and delivery with epidurals, and other things that we have to do, particularly when we're trying to take care of our patients. So not a panacea. What's the other problem with Subutex? How many people, does anybody here dispense Subutex? Thank God. You know how you get your Subutex ability? You go online, you take your quiz, Ta-da! You are now Subutex trained. And you can do Subutex clinic now. Yes? No, I understand you have to go for an eight-hour course, don't you? No, it's uh, online. There's no eight-hour. It's online. You just oh, have to pass the test. You have to just pass the test. And sign it and you're done. Yeah. That, that's it. Well, at least methadone, you really, they're strictly controlled. Really tight, frankly. Suboxone, so I mean, it's like the Wild West. I mean, you can go out there, like you said, pass the test, and you're, ta-da, magically you're there. Oh, by the way, you're supposed to do all this counseling, too? Yeah, whatever. Well, about, uh, what about amphetamines? Not particularly uh, helpful. Um, there's really not much you can do with amphetamine abuse except try to get people off the stuff. There's very little substitution out there. Where is Mercy? <laughs> it's in Rome. It's in St. Peter's Square. That's where she is. Benzodiazepines, uh, I probably have more experience with that than anybody in the universe now. And... Uh, Basically, there's nothing you can do except wean people slowly. That's it. There is no magic. And they can be a real, real, real bugger to get people off of. Uh, I don't know if you've had experience with people who've been on uh, a long, long-standing anti-anxiolytics with benzos. They, they just don't do well, many of them. It's very difficult to wean them, and it takes weeks to months to get them down off of those things. And be very careful with benzodiazepines because they can seize, and it's, it's really interesting, interesting drug. The devil, I hate benzos. I don't prescribe it all. Really. A treatment for alcohol, there's very little about that in, in pregnancy. Uh, it's also, nobody drinks. <laughs> Except they do drink. <laughs> they do drink. Until recently, we really had no way to test for it. Now we've got glutaraldehyde in the urine. And we also have glutaraldehyde in the cord bloods, and in the cord tissue, actually. So now we can test. So now we're actually looking for alcohol as well. And what we found is probably about a 5 to 10% usage of alcohol in our population, but nobody drinks. Nobody drinks. So perhaps the epidemic of autism is not autism. Maybe it's something else. Well, this is the future of uh, health care for OBGYNs. And for those of us who like to do OB still, one uh, one hour delivery, the baby's free. Right? That's, that's where we're heading for. It's a cost continuum. Well, what about what we see? Again, I pointed out most of my patients, over 50% of my patient population, have a comorbid disorder, including depression, uh, bipolar. I love bipolar. Okay, how many people here have patients who are diagnosed with bipolar? What a crock, right? I'm bipolar. I said, really? Are you on any medications? Well, no. Okay. Are you doing okay? Well, yeah. I stopped all that stuff. And how long have you been off? Oh, I've been off for you know several several weeks and several. So the question, of course, I'm going to ask you now is, do you think you're really bipolar? 
No, I really don't think I am. Bingo, you're not. That's right. <laughs> So, I mean, seriously, okay? I have a 16-year-old daughter. So anybody who's had a teenager feels like they're my boy, right? I mean, one day you're here, one day you're there. It's like this kind of thing. You never know which daughter you're going to meet in the morning. It's like, okay, is this the good daughter or is this the bad? <laughs> Schizoaffective disorder, schizophrenia, these are very serious, and I do see these not, 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 not frequently in my clinic. Trash diagnosis. Borderline, that kind of defines most of my patients and colleagues, frankly. <laughs> Okay, nobody say anything about me. Well, what can we do? And uh, actually, it's a really interesting sort of an approach. I call it the high-touch, not high-tech approach, because that's really what it is. We use group. I have a certified addictions counselor. If you're going to do this, you really need to have a certified addictions counselor to help you do this. If you don't, don't do it. That's my, that's my one caveat for this. Do not do it. Do not have a genuinely certified addictions counselor, and it's someone who's on your page. We're on the same page. We put our group together. We're all on the abstinence train here at my place. So we're all on the same page. Don't get somebody who's not on your page. That won't work well. There's uh, the psychosocial intervention with behavioral therapy, which we'll talk a little bit more about. The, the use of reward vouchers or prizes, I'm going to talk a little more about that. And data support, this is very useful in opioid and other uh, type of uh, dependencies. And the combination seems to work best. What we have essentially is a, it's like 12 visits. It's not like a 12 step, but it's not really. We use the cognitive uh, uh, behavioral therapy with contingency management. Everybody says, oh, that sounds really bogus. You give them a little reward and they, they, they come back and they go, most of these women that I take care of, a lot of the women who are very, very, uh, uh, have had nobody really do anything for them for years, really. So a voucher for something that they can get for their baby is very important. And at the end of it, you get a car seat, or you get a, you get a playpen, or you get something else that you can use for your baby, or you get a whole layout, or whatever you, whatever they would like to get. There's two or three things. We have a small grant that helps us pay for this. But this works very, very well, and they come back for the vouchers, and if they'll stick with it, we'll see what happens with this. And every visit they come to see me, they get asked by myself and my residents, what are you doing, how are you doing, where are you at? And we'll talk a little bit about we in a minute. This is Mercy on the uh, upper uh, lake at Glendalough in Ireland. If you have a chance to go to Ireland, I would hardly recommend going to Wicklow County. Just beautiful. Um, this looks like West Virginia to me. If you walk into this setting. This is West Virginia. So it's very, 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 very beautiful. So to help us with this, we actually went to our population that we were going to help serve and said, okay, what do you think about substance abuse? And of course, the part of this was because they're drug addicts, right? It's their fault. They're just drug addicts. We don't know what to do. They, we hate them. They're, they're nasty. They're stinky. They, yeah, you know, they, don't, they come in with the no prenatal care, blah, 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 blah right? Yeah. Same stuff. And we had about 55 people come in from all over the uh, state of West Virginia, which is quite a few people for, for a uh, conference uh, that's about four or five hours that was actually during the week. And they actually took time out of their day to come to this. Um, nurses were a high percent, clinical psychologists, physicians a smaller group, social workers uh, quite a number, and other health professionals, anybody else who kind of showed up. And what we found out is we did a pre-test, post-test. After we did everything, we said, okay, what do you think your knowledge was before? What do you think your knowledge was after? And we actually talked about women and substances and how women are different than, than men are and how particularly pregnant women are different than, than non-pregnant women and how there's this whole, your whole idea of what you're dealing with is entirely different than what you're thinking. And that your, your, your basically your view of the patients is affecting your ability to take care of them, right? I mean, you have your biases. So you never get past that to take care of the patients. And what we really found out was the most improvement we had is the gender differences with substance abuse. Now this is critically important to understand is women, one, get addicted faster and more deeply for many reasons. But they are also more likely to get help if, if asked. If asked. And they're also everything, but the most one was looking at gender differences and understanding that they had an attitude problem with what they did. And so we put together our program because of this. Well, let's talk a little bit about how we're 
helping with this. One, you get drug screened when you come in, everybody. Everybody. And you know why we do that, right? I don't need your permission. If it's my standard of care, and I screen everybody, regardless of whatever, I don't need your permission. It's just like a VDRL or an RPR, or whatever you want to get in my clinic or CBC. You come to my clinic, new OB, you're told you're getting your drug screen. It's part of the orientation. So that's the way it is. And if you pop positive, you get to come and talk to my addictions person, and you get to come and talk to me, right, and my, my residents. Now the problem we have is that not everybody gets told like they're supposed to, right? So we're working on these bugs. You maybe think of some way to do this, and I'll be willing to hear what you've got to say. Because when they find out they're coming to the high risk clinic or they're coming to that clinic, they want to know why am I going there? Well, it's because you pop positive for opiates, benzos, and crack cocaine. Well, I don't do any of that. Really? Well, then I guess we must have mixed the urine up with somebody else. I guess certainly yeah, that's possible. Yeah. So that's what they do. And then what we do is we engage them in our, our program with the, the, the uh, addictions group and individual counseling if they want it. And we do weekly visits for a while until we get them squared away. If you are on opiates and you are getting them illicitly, I will start therapeutic substitution. And I work with my addictions counselor closely and with my residents. And I, and I use either uh, something like Lortabs or Norco. And I use, depending on what's going on, I use it twice a day or three times a day and wean them very slowly. I usually start at 10 milligrams two or three times a day and I go down two and a half milligrams a day a week. So if you're on 10 and 10, the next week you're seven and a half and 10. And the next week it's seven and a half and seven and a half, seven and a half and five. It's going to take about 8 or 10 or 12 weeks to get completely off. Now, those babies are going to die. They're going to go through withdrawal. Nonsense. Hogwash. Ridiculous. Stupid. Right? It's really stupid. If mom's not going through withdrawal, is the baby going through withdrawal? Uh, no. No. And, oh, by the way, it works. So let's take a look and see. Here he says, well, you know, you have 46 people that are OP dependent that you identified this last year. And out of that, 12 of them went through and completed the program completely. Out of that 46, we had 26%, we had 12 women that were born, babies were born without opiates at delivery. And we screen everybody who's positive at delivery as well. And we also screen anybody else who we think might be suspicious. And we do cords and urines. So if they don't get a urine, we do a baby cord, and we send that. So we got a, a double way of doing it. And we don't need your permission, by the way, to do that, if there's a suspicion. The other good news about this is if my women participate and the babies are born substance-free, CPS doesn't get involved. If you're born positive, it's an automatic referral to CPS. That's the law. So my patients have two, two good reasons to get to get clean. One, their baby will not be born addicted. And if they've had a baby born addicted, they, they know exactly what I'm talking about. They've had some friend who's had the baby doing the herky jerky in the NICU, right? Yeah. And they don't have to worry about CPS. And they are definitely afraid of CPS, as they should be, as everybody should be, right? I want them in your life. And so what we've been able to do is do that and sustain that. This last year's data I've got to look at, I think it's going to be about the same. Most programs are 10% or less with substance abuse. And we're at 25 or so percent. And we've been doing this for about four or five years now. So we're, we're starting to get some idea of how to do this. And we actually presented this in Singapore. People really liked it. Why didn't my resident? You know, that's my resident. What is that all about? How do they get to go to Singapore? I'm going to Peoria or something. <laughs> or Roanoke. I don't know. Well, the other thing we have in uh, West Virginia, which is really quite good, and I'm proud to say we have this, is we have this right from the start initiative that West Virginia does. From birth to one year of age, you can have uh, basically case managers set up for you and your baby that will help you take care of your child and meet your needs and help you navigate the system. And we've actually dovetailed with them, and they help us postpartum to do what we need to do. The one area we still have not got our arms around is how are they doing six or eight months later? which is the question everybody's going to ask me. And I don't know that yet. That's the part I'm working on now. But what I do know is that every one of these women is being plugged into our program for a year. And it's voluntary. So if you don't want to, you don't have to. But 
What's interesting is if we introduce the women to them up front, they meet my people. These are nurses. These are not social workers. Okay? So I'm not going to get social workers, but these are nurses who can help them navigate the medical. And if they need social services, they'll help them do that. But these are clinical nurses. They can do home visits. They can help take care of their babies. They're there for clinical help. They're not there to identify, you know, unsafe conditions and take the kid away from them. That's not their purpose. I mean, they can do that, but that's not why they're there. And so the, the patients love this. And basically, they can be seen at all these different times. They can be seen actually as often as they want. But the best part about this is, is they can do it for a year if they want. Where's this? Anybody know? Come on. Nobody knows what this is? Ay, ay, ay. It's Portugal. What would be in Portugal? Fatima. Fatima. Yeah. It's a terrible picture, right? Actually, the summer. It's my fault. It's a bad picture. It's Fatima. Yeah. It was really very beautiful. Like, that's one of the few pictures I was able to get that actually worth the part. It's in Portugal. Well, what are my challenges and where are we at? Well, I think that the, the, the basic thing is, you know, in my opinion, you're going to have to get over and screen everybody. I'm just telling you. Sooner or later, it's coming to a, you know, to, to a you know, hospital near you because anytime there's an adverse outcome and you don't have this information, one, you're not giving good care, and two, you're setting yourself up for some very interesting medical legal stuff. Once you identify this, you really have to get a place where you can send them to, a good additions counselor. I mean, I have people send all, I mean, I get up pretty much all now, which is fine because a lot of people don't have the resources and they don't want to do it, and I'm okay with that. Uh, to us, to get group, it's take and support. Support of the providers is very, very important. I have to keep hammering on my residents. <clears throat> God has to keep saying hi. You've got to be nice to people. You can't treat them like blah, 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 whatever you think you're going to treat somebody like. And ask and ask and ask and ask and ask. Just like our tobacco program, are you decreasing your tobacco? How's it going? You're not using You're not doing illicit. You know, I'm going to screen you today. You know, what's going on? The usual things. High touch, not high tech. And basically, I still need to develop an inpatient detoxification program because I don't have that yet. And uh, it's a little frustrating when somebody wants to do it. I get a bed for an inpatient, I have a very difficult time getting pregnant women into it. I think there's a part of our challenge for us is to engage families better. We do we try to do a really good job with that with my addictions and other people, but that can be a real bugger. If partners using, hard for you not to use, right? If you're in a really bad drug, drug culture, very difficult. You've got to get people out of that culture and someplace else away from that. That can be a real problem. Uh, I need to find better ways to engage the community. They need to understand that it's out there and it's real. I mean, 30% of my patients in, a, in the private side is probably 10, at least 10 or 15%. So it's real. And people need to get a grip on this. And these people are driving cars, by the way, down your highway. <laughs> Just a cheery thought for you. But that's why the traffic's so bad in Washington. Do that. Need to pull together data and look at this and say, okay, what works here? What doesn't work there? How is this going? How's it going? Um, nobody wants to talk about it. That's why I call it the elephant in the room. Nobody wants to publish. Nobody wants to do it. They don't. There's no skin in that game, so to speak. Well, I, I just don't believe that one. And two, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you what I think about it from a philosophical standpoint. We need better means for follow-up after delivery and postpartum. That's my biggest bugaboo. How do I get? How do I keep them engaged? How do I keep them into the to the, uh, the system to keep them from from uh, re, uh, reusing substances? This is Mercy's choir singing at the UN. And if you look very, 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 very carefully, she's right there. <laughs> the little short girl singing that solo over there, that's mercy. Despite the fact you broke her clavicle, won't be. Sorry. Mercy always says, did you, did you see my doctor at the, at the conference? I said, your doctor? She goes, yeah, Dr. Holty, my doctor. I go, he's not your doctor. I said, his wife was your, well, you know, he birthed me. I said, yeah, he broke your clavicle, too, so I think you ring it <laughs> So, we have some very encouraging things, and, and if you want to talk about it, you can tell you one of my passions is, is, is just like, it's like hospice, you know, I'm, I'm like a dog with a bone, I got my teeth in it, I want to keep at it. You need a certified admissions counselor, you need to really want to do it, you need to be able to do pregnancy and beyond. We've done some really good stuff at our institutional level and at our clinic level. We are uh, also responsible for some of other pilot projects that are being done throughout the state, very similar to what we're doing, and uh, as I said, we're having fun most days. Most days. Although, I always tell people, I said, my clinic is uh, kind of like a Jerry Springer episode every day. 
I really, I really, I mean, I have to laugh. The stories they tell me, and I'll just laugh. And they'll kind of look at me, and they kind of get that look, and I go, you know, it really just does suck to me. I'm just telling you right here. They kind of laugh, because it's true. We're just having fun most days. Really are. And I guess we're questions and comments later. Is that right? Are we doing questions and comments later, uh, 